In the kinetics unit, one of the things we look at are factors that affect rates of reaction. And I'm not a teacher who spends a lot of time preparing demonstrations. And I like demos that I can find the materials for quickly. They don't take a long time for me to prep the solutions or get exotic reagents that uh, require my actually remembering to order the stuff in March for a demonstration that I'm going to do the following December. Um, so anytime I can find something that's simple, quick, and easy and illustrates a concept, uh, I'm going to use it. And this particular series of demonstrations uses simple stuff that's sitting around the classroom. Some of the things are reactions that my students have seen time and time again. Kinetics comes fairly late in the year in most chemistry courses, and so some of these reactions they are very familiar with, but now I'm going to use them in a different way to illustrate a different point. Um, we know what the factors are that influence rates of reactions. We know that temperature is one of those factors. We know concentration is one of those factors. We know that the nature of the reactant is one of those factors. And we know that surface area is one of those factors. And all of those are related to collision theory, uh, which again is another part of kinetics and the kinetic unit in most high school chemistry classes. So we're going to take a look at, first of all, uh, surface area and how it affects the rate of a reaction. Uh, it doesn't take anything really complicated. It, I realize in most modern classrooms, this is not something that you can turn around and pick up from behind you anymore. But it was in my classroom for a long time. All I had was a chalkboard. Now they've got dry erase boards, so it's a bit of a problem. But I have chalk that I've saved for a long time. And so this particular reaction uses chalk. Uh, and uh, chalk we know, of course, is calcium carbonate primarily with a little bit of binder in it. And to show surface area, I'm going to show the reaction of ca calcium carbonate or chalk with hydrochloric acid. So in this Petri dish, in two of the wells I have, and you can see that because I just shook it, that there's some hydrochloric acid in there, roughly one molar concentration. I haven't spent a lot of time worrying about it. it again, if it was from my classroom, there would be a bottle that would say one molar on it, and I would know because I made it that it was someplace between one and four or five. Um, and so that's not a real problem as long as the concentrations are roughly the same. To show surface area, of course I want to do one piece of chalk that's essentially unchanged. So the surface area is simply just the surface of that cylinder that the chalk is made out of. And in fact it won't even be quite that because when I drop it down into the, the well, what will happen is that only the part that's underneath the liquid will, in fact, be in contact with it. To get a larger surface area, I have to smash the chalk, break it apart. And to do that, and again, this is fairly late in the year, my students, when I pick this up, will tell me exactly what this is. They'll all look at it and go, oh, Mr. Lewis has the physical change facilitator, which he has purchased from a scientific supply company. And this, in fact, does do a great job for facilitating physical changes. So I'll take one piece of chalk and break another one so it's roughly the same size. And I'll set one aside. And using my facilitator, I will facilitate a physical change with the other piece of the chalk. physical change has taken place. And now I am ready to gather together some of the chalk, which has had its surface area increased a great deal. And another piece of chalk whose surface area has not really been increased, well, hasn't been increased from what it was originally. I'm going to place both of these in the one molar HCl, and then we'll take a look at the rate of the reaction. Um, Again, my students would probably at this point know that carbon dioxide is going to be given off when calcium carbonate reacts with an acid because they've done the acid base chapter by this time. Uh, if not, I might spend some time talking about the reaction, depending on just how much I want to get into it. I'm going to drop this one in first, and then you can see that reaction, and then I'm going to drop the ground up chalk in. And you can see that the ground up chalk is reacting so fast here that it's starting to bubble out of the petri dish. Uh, the 
other piece is bubbling pretty vigorously. I mean, I want something that, that's easy to see, but I also want something that gives me a real indication of what's going on. And you can see that the ground up one is actually starting to go over into the other well of the Petri dish. It's a pretty quick easy, safe illustration of the difference between the two reactions, the rates of the reactions, is related to the surface area. It's quick, it's simple, it doesn't take much effort. On an overhead, it's easy to see. If you wanted to let your students do it as an activity, they could certainly do it, no problem. The cost is negligible, and so it's a fast way to do it. Quick, easy, simple. We use the stuff that I've got laying around so that when I walk in in the morning at 6 o'clock to school and then I sit at my desk until quarter to 8, and at quarter to 8 I go, oh gosh, I have to teach today. Um, at 8 o'clock, then I jump up and go find some stuff. And the chalk is on the chalk tray. Now it's actually it's under the sink. But um, it's all there. It's ready for me. I can set it up. I can be ready to go in next to no time at all. So that's the first part of the demonstration. I'm looking at one factor, and this is surface area. So now we're going to move to a second part of the reaction in the demonstration. And I'm going to do this one in a slightly different fashion. So let me clean off the tabletop, sort of, and talk a little bit about what I want to do in the second part of this. Probably, uh, well, many years ago, there's no sense in dating this. Many years ago, I was in an NSTA convention, and I saw a young woman uh, do a demonstration and talk about doing it as a silent lecture. And when I watched it, I thought, that's really cool. I've got to try doing that sometime. And so it kind of plopped into the back of my mind. Uh, at another point in time, I remember reading some stuff about Hubert Allier, and Hubert Allier was a chemistry teacher at Princeton and probably the, the person that started it all for a lot of us in terms of demonstrating chemistry. I, I suppose you can go back to Faraday. But for those of us that uh, taught in the year that I taught in, Hubert Allier was sort of our, our guru, the guy that we all looked to that you know, kind of set up the rest of us. Uh, and I read that Hubert Allier had done some silent lectures. So again, that clicked in the back of my mind, silent lecture, good idea. What precipitated the first silent lecture I ever did was the day I walked into school and realized after the third sentence I said that I no longer had a voice. I was standing in the room going, ah, ah, ah. And the students liked that, but I didn't really enjoy sounding like the Aflac duck. And so at that point in time, it was for me, I've got to do this in another way. I need to do a silent lecture. It just happened to be on that particular day that I was doing this sort of stuff. And so I started thinking, do I really need to talk while I do this? Or can my students actually get the information and the ideas without me ever saying anything beyond walking in and saying, I want you to make very careful observations of what I'm doing, and then I want you to draw some conclusions based on what you've read in your textbook, there's a scary concept, and what you've seen in the classroom. So I'm going to do the second part of this as a silent lecture. And what I want you guys to do is observe what's going on here. I'm going to put this piece of paper on and a Petri dish, which has one, three, and one-tenth molar HCl in it. And this is the way it's set up. This now becomes a silent lecture. I want you to make careful observations of what I'm doing, write down careful notes, and be ready.
Great. There's a couple things about this that are kind of neat that you'll discover as in your classroom that I, that I got a big kick out of. One of them was, by the way, it didn't happen in here, but it would in your classroom. This is the first time I ever did a silent lecture. I got about, oh, maybe two or three minutes into it. And for the first time in my memory, every kid in the room was looking at me. And that kind of blew me away, because it was a little scary. Because, you know, I have some kids that pay attention, but I got a lot of kids that are like this. And was, that was fun. That was really neat, because they were really tuned in, because they had to watch what was going on. And they're taking notes, and, they're, and they, they want to take notes really fast, because they've got to keep watching what's going on. And that was kind of neat. Uh, here, it was a little disconcerting, because every time I looked up at you guys, you're looking at the camera screens off on the side. It's like, nobody's paying attention to what I'm doing. <laughs> but silent lectures are fun. Let me tell you a couple things about them, though. First of all, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, that's it. If they're much longer than that, they get worn out because they just can't concentrate. And it's hard to do to take notes and concentrate for 15 minutes. So if you've got something, make it simple, make it short. Make it, make it a lot of fun, too, at the same time. You've got to put some pantomiming in it. You can certainly write things on the board, instructions, if you want to, to build into it a little bit, uh, or to you know, point at things and go, or you can go to the periodic table and point at stuff. You can do stuff like that with it and pantomime a lot, but it really is kind of neat. And I r really did, want, I lost my voice at least once every year. And when I lose it, I would plan some kind of silent activity, silent lecture, at least part of the period, and get them going on that. And it was a lot of fun. And it gave me a chance to, to goof off. And I had kids come back that would say, God, you remember when you did that silent lecture? And I'd go, yeah, do you remember what it was about? No, but it was a cool thing. <laughs> so yeah, again, this is really neat as a demonstration. If you don't do it as a silent lecture, it's very simple. You know, you've got 10th molar. The 10th molar is still reacting. The one molar, I think, is finally finished. And the three molar was gone before the other two had gone, and I gave them a lot of time. So concentration, rates of reaction, real simple way to do it. Magnesium and hydrochloric acid. At the point that we do kinetics in, my, in the classroom that I taught in, in my school, I would have probably done this reaction 30 times it, for various reasons in class, collecting hydrogen gas, reaction of an acid with a metal, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, early on in the year is an example of a chemical reaction versus a, a, you know, a physical change. You, you can just think about it, and it's just about anything that we do in chemistry that involves a reaction or related to a reaction, an acid in an active metal works very nicely. OK, the third part of this, or the third aspect, is to look at the nature of the reactants. This is one that. You could certainly do as a silent lecture, but it's not a requirement. I mean, if you had done this one, you could come back and do this one as a silent lecture, or you can simply just set it up like this. And so now I have three different metals. We've seen that acid reacts with magnesium, and we'll continue to take a look at that. But now we'll go to one molar HCl again. And I'm just going to dump this in. Uh, I've got copper in one spot, zinc in another, and then magnesium. And we'll take a look at the reaction here. And I, we've seen the magnesium already several times with the one molar, but it's good to bring it back and illustrate it again, reacting pretty vigorously. If we jump over to the zinc here, we can see some bubbles, but it's not enormously fast. There's a difference between the activity of magnesium and zinc uh, with respect to hydrochloric acid. And then we've got this piece of copper here, which essentially is doing nothing. In fact, is doing nothing as far as we can tell. On a molecular level, it might be really exciting down there but because we see the hydrogen ions hitting the surface of the metal and not being able to cause any reaction to take place and bouncing off and going back up into the solution. And it would be going back and forth and back and forth. But hey, that's a little bit tough to get across. Uh, but as chemists, we, we, we really feel that that's an exciting situation. So again, we've looked at 
the three uh, different metals and reacting with the same acid, and certainly the nature of the reactant is another factor. That's one that we, a lot of times we gloss over, completely forget about when we're talking about rates of reaction, that you know, it makes a difference what you work with. Um, temperature is, is the last one, probably the thing that I often do, and I'm not going to do that with this set, but with temperature, light sticks are probably the easiest thing to use. And I, there's another demonstration in the series that shows that. So two things that we've seen here. One, a way to illustrate some of the factors that affect rates of reaction. Second thing, an interesting way to present a demonstration to your classroom, or an interesting way to present maybe a mini topic in your classroom that isn't really a demonstration, but it's just something that you're trying to get across that you can pantomime to your students and have them kind of infer and draw conclusions from what they see you doing without you actually ever speaking. And if you try it, you really will be amazed at their engagement and the fact that you've got everybody watching what you're doing. And at least the first time you do it, it's kind of scary.